Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 235th podcast video cast for the week ending April 18th, 2024. A lot to cover today. We'll start with some quick family stuff and get right down to it. First off, want to acknowledge uh, Annabelle got published in the Swim Swam Swim Journal, which is the kind of industry journal for swimmers. This is a big deal for her. And uh, so they recognized her accomplishments in there. Very proud of her. It said, a Stanford Sailfish Aquatic Club nine-year-old Annabelle Hayes pulled out a victory in the 50 back with a time of 31.05, just to blink off her best time of 31.00 from February. Uh, Beth Botsford still owns the meet record in the event at 28.93 from way back in 1992. So now she's got a new goal. Uh, Hayes added personal best in the 200 IM at 228.70 and 50 fly at 31.54. So way to go, Annabelle. Uh, moving right along, we have ah, we have uh, Caitlin with the girls at uh, my in-laws. So this is Dr. John Laszlo, my, uh, her stepfather, who uh, played a, a, a key role in raising Caitlin and then Annabelle and Mimi. And uh, he actually um, has quite an uh, accomplished career. Most importantly, obviously, he went to Columbia, which is a big deal. Uh, but other than, there, uh, other than that, we bear no resemblance because he went on to Harvard Medical School. I, on the other hand, did not. Uh, I wrote a couple books, uh, three books on cancer, the definitive book on childhood leukemia, ran research at uh, American Cancer Society, was also a uh, professor and ran uh, Duke University Medical Center. So quite an extensive background in cancer research and, and as a doctor. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we always uh, talk about the kids and their accomplishments, but I, I kind of liken it, you know, Caitlin's involvement to like, uh, you know, if, if I'm the owner of the restaurant, does the easy job, you know, kind of sets up the building, buys the pots and pans, puts all the ingredients. But unless you get a master chef in there that knows how to mix all the ingredients perfectly, you're never going to get a Michelin star rating. And that's what she really does is she manages it all, gets the kids to everything, finds the right teams, uh, finds the right events, finds the right strategies to to put it all together and that's why uh they're able to get the amazing results that they get uh both uh with the the homeschool and uh and with the sports with the water polo and the swimming because if you you can you can set up the best building and the best ingredients and the best uh kitchen but if you don't have the master chef that can put it all together you're going out of business and uh she provides that magic touch and uh and you can see it in the smile on the girl's face and, uh, and I'm sure they're with uh, Dr. Laszlo taking great pride in, in seeing how they've developed and uh, what she's been able to do as a mom, coach, et cetera. So uh, good stuff there. Uh, ah, got to go see Liz Clayman at the Clayman Countdown. I so love going into the studio. It's always fun to see everyone, uh, but particularly Liz, because Liz gave me my first chance on TV almost five years ago. Super grateful for that. So it was fun to go in. Uh, and it's always for me, it's like uh, I take every single opportunity as the first time out there. You always come and you give it give it your all. This is a couple pictures outside of the Fox and News Corp building. For those of you who haven't been on 6th Avenue and 48th, uh, pretty special place when you get into the city. Uh, definitely drop by. And then um, also want to recognize almost forgot Mimi had a phenomenal water polo weekend and then we'll get right down to it uh, she had a series of games with her um, amazing team Greenwich Aquatics out in Long Island this weekend and uh, this clip Caitlin got because I stayed back and took Annabelle to her swim practices uh, but I uh, was really happy to see this and here it is so here she is in the swim off Right here, she wins the swim off, passes it to her teammate, and then the pass gets away from her, gets a ball under here, gets the ball back, takes the ball, looks around, tries to pass it, no one's open, and what does she do? Boom, whips it in, so uh, fun stuff, good video tape 
by Caitlin and great job by Mimi and her teammates. Unbelievable stuff there. So um, this section, we are going to first kick it off with the segment with Liz Clayman on the Clayman Countdown. This is going to create the context for t- this week's podcast episode 35, uh, 235. And the reason is we're going to talk about a, 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 a key component that we touched on last week uh, before anyone was talking about it, and still no one's talking about it, uh, which is the Fed winding down the the taper and the implications that's going to have on yields and rates. While everyone's focused on cuts, they're missing the $9 trillion elephant in the room, which is going to have an enormous impact on actually starting to compress yields as we get uh, further on in the year. So we're going to listen in here. Do that the equities market is holding up pretty well in this last, let's call it uh, 55 minutes left to trade, because earlier lost nearly all of the gains when Powell said, you know what, the progress on inflation has stalled and slowed. Yeah, well, you know, we were on last month and we said expect a 3 to 8% pullback. Mm-hmm. Uh, we actually got 4.3% peak to trough in the S&P futures. And on the second hedge, which was semiconductors, it actually corrected over 9%. So I think what you have here is a little bit of exhaustion in the selling, a lot of geopolitical fear. We actually took off half of our S&P hedge this morning and we're keeping our our semiconductor Okay, I need you to explain for our viewers who don't know what it means to be S&P hedged. Yeah, so we had uh, put spreads on the S&P 500, which we talked about last month, Mm -hmm. uh, as the market fell. Meaning bearish. Meaning bearish, Mm -hmm. uh, those go up in value. But we were long 98% of the portfolio. So we had 1% in uh, derivative hedge, long put spread uh, on the S&P, and 1% on the semiconductor index. We are keeping the semiconductor hedge uh, full tilt. The risk tolerance some people have, Steve, is not as hot and high, perhaps, as Tom and some of the other younger whippersnappers out there. And so when you look at the Treasury yields that we see right now, particularly on the longer end of the curve, I mean, now the the 10-year yesterday was up something like 12 basis points. Do you lock in some of that yield right now, sort of longer term, with some of the cash that maybe people have sitting on the sidelines and aren't in Treasuries yet? Well, and that's the point. We're, we're not going to be able to, or few, would be able to actually time the top in rates. And so what we've been advocating is there's, there's something close to $9 trillion sitting in money markets. For fixed income, our data shows that most investors are, are pretty significantly underallocated um, because I think in large part everybody did move to the front end and they were waiting. But now it's time to start layering in. People dollar cost average into equities. There's no reason why you shouldn't start dollar cost averaging into bonds and get the portfolio right size because bonds are a good diversifier for risk assets over most cycles. And there are a lot of uh, ETFs where you can pile into certain types of bonds. And I'm not just talking treasuries. You're talking fixed income in many regards, right? Yeah. And so as an example, we, we traced out three different scenarios. So if you are in Inflation is going to persist. It's going to be challenging to bring it down. And then if you're in the camp where you might think that even a hike might be on the table, you can buy very short term stuff like ESCOV is a zero to three month T-bill fund. Mm -hmm. You have STIP, which is a short duration uh, inflation fund, a tips fund. Mm -hmm. If you're in more of a uh, bullish camp or a soft landing camp, you can just buy the market. So you can buy the ag, you can buy a universal index and high yield as an example. So there are a lot of ways to play this. And of course, if you're in a if you're in a hard landing camp um, and some people think just by definition, higher for longer may not end well uh, eventually, then you can buy long duration. Tom, what are your most active positions? As we hear so many different types of scenarios, soft landing, no landing, hard landing, equities can continue to to stretch out this rally. Okay, so we did two things. We covered half the S&P hedge this morning and we went long TLT bonds. Why? Because everyone's focused on cuts. And what the the news was in the last week was from the Fed minutes. They're going to cut quantitative tightening in half. So now they're putting $95 billion of supply on the market every month. Yields go higher. They're going to cut that in half to $45 billion. And they said, quote unquote, in the minutes, soon. $45 billion of less supply means there's going to be a greater bid in bonds, compression in yields. We like that. As far as equities, we've got two. One is brand new called GXO Logistics, one of Brad Jacobs' companies. He just wrote a book, How to Make a Few Billion. Yeah, we had him on the show. <laughs> he, he started like 
38 different companies, all becoming billion dollar market cap yeah. companies. Yeah, so, so he made four billion for himself. He made tens of billions for his shareholders. If you had invested in URI, United Rentals, when he went public, you would have made 50 times your money. A million becomes 50 million. If you had invested in XPO Logistics when he got involved in 2011, you made 52 times your money. One million becomes 52. Now we're doing GXO Logistics, which was spun out of XPO. It's down 50% because they do warehousing, they do uh, e-commerce fulfillment, reverse logistics. And the, the feeling was that the goods demand went down. They get paid per units. The business kept producing. Services demand went up after, after COVID. Now it's balancing out. Goods and services are equal. They're going to recover. They're going to have the beneficiary. They only have 2.2% of the market. Huge room for expansion. And you know how Brad works. He does a lot of roll-ups. He does a lot of acquisitions. They'll grow high single digits organically, double digits inorganically, acquisitively. We like the opportunity there. Okay. Uh, so, you know, you've got to have a strong stomach for some of this. Uh, we thank you both very much, Steve and Tom. Thank you. Thanks, busy, Liz. busy day. Okay. And we're back. Uh, I also want to thank, in addition to Liz Clayman, Jake Mack, Finley Walker, and Catherine Myers for having me on. I uh, also want to thank Kelly O'Grady, who came and grabbed me after the segment to do a pod segment uh, to be featured the next day. And um, I'm very grateful that, that she thought of me for that. And she'll be hosting the Claim and Countdown next week. So as always, you want to tune into the Claim and Countdown every day. And also next week when Kelly O'Grady is hosting uh, for Liz. So, um, so that's kind of the context. And let's get into some more granularity on this concept about um, uh, the Fed taper. What you have here, here's an article from Reuters. We, we covered the Wall Street Journal article last week, but the, the t subject is Fed looks to slice balance sheet runoff pace by half. So it's about 60 billion a month in treasuries and 35 billion per month in mortgage bonds. They are letting mature and not reinvesting the proceeds, which is what's taking the uh, balance sheet down. And what they are afraid of, as we covered last week, is uh, a liquidity shock. So the facility for bank reserves has gone from something like uh, 2.3 trillion to 480 or 450 billion. And the interbank lending market, where banks that have excess liquidity can lend overnight to banks that need liquidity, uh, has pretty much dried up through the COVID period. And if they let these reserves run too low, they could really run into a liquidity shock problem. And I think that's why they're now starting to get serious about uh, tapering the taper. And basically, uh, rather than letting you know up to 95, some months they've only been doing 75, 76 billion a month because there's no market for the mortgages. Uh, they're doing 635 in, in mortgages and they can only get half out there without disrupting the market. But on the treasuries, they're definitely going to be cutting that in half, which is critical because as you get 30 billion, 40 billion, a less supply of bonds on the market every month, that that keeps that capital in the system uh, to go into other risk assets versus buying the bonds available on the open market. And the other thing is it reduces supply so that um, uh, demand is more easily met, which means there's a bid in bonds and a compression of yields. So, yes, cutting the Fed funds rate is is helpful to lowering interest rates. But the the other thing that's very helpful is stop selling bonds on the open market and creating supply, which exceeds demand, which is causing rates to spike. Uh, so as that supply diminishes, we're going to see some real help in terms of yields. Bonds are going to get bid. Yields are going to compress. And what does this mean? Uh, OK, ahead of the Fed meeting, officials have been hinting at what is to come and what the slowdown and runoff might accomplish. Quote, a slower but still meaningful pace will provide more time for banks and money market participants to redistribute liquidity and for the FOMC to assess liquidity conditions. Dallas Fed Lori Logan said on April 4th, 
Uh, before taking the leadership spot at the Dallas Fed, Logan ran the process of implementing monetary policy at the New York Fed. If you remember, she was in charge during the last liquidity shock. So she's been kind of heading this movement to make sure they don't run into another liquidity shock. And um, this article said, where did it say? Uh, March embarked on that. Okay, here we go. As for when the Fed will shift gears, JP Morgan economist Michael Faroli said, quote, we continue to believe that the committee will announce a halving of the Treasury cap in the next FOMC meeting in early May with implement implementation occurring in mid-May. And I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, with what I'm seeing with the setup with the bonds, which is why we bought bonds on Tuesday and we announced on, we actually bought what we did was we closed half the S&P hedge. We closed the other half today. That wasn't a, um, a that was a that was an unsuccessful hedge because we ran um, out of time. We expected the three to eight percent correction between late February and early April. Uh, we got five percent, but it's mid April, so we didn't get the full value that we expected. We extracted the value left we rolled that into uh um tlt call spreads that have an expected value of um five to ten x uh so what will wind up happening is we're still going to be able to create that excess five percent of capital uh from one percent and then the semiconductor hedge is very successful and that has a lot more time on it uh, and I think as of today, that was up like two and a half times in eight weeks or whatever it happens to be. So like 120% uh, in that range. So call it double plus, call it 100, at least this morning when I looked at it, 120% in four weeks. So um, so that one's still full tilt. We have that on. We think there's probably going to be a little more weakness for, for semis. Uh, and then we just rolled uh, what was left of the S and P hedge into long treasuries because we can win two ways on long treasuries. We can win if the market collapses or some geopolitical thing happens. The market's not going to collapse, by the way, um, um, and the market goes down. We can also win if the market goes up because the market would probably go up also on a compression of yields because banks uh, balance sheets will be healthier and all the uh, groups that are helped by interest rates will, will benefit. So um, with with treasuries where they are, we can win both ways and we like that. And we were able to get a much higher asymmetry in long treasuries relative to short S&P from these levels. And the uh, uh, semiconductor uh, tactical short hedge that we have on is winning and we're going to we're going to press it. So um, all in that. 2% of equity capital is going to prove to be, uh, I think, a huge contributor that we can get long into year end and add that uh, meaningful extra alpha from just what was a small amount of capital uh, at risk. And um, as it stands, what we're seeing this week is an unbelievable trove of opportunities already even before you get up to 8%. I don't, I don't know. We may go to 8%. We may be done already. I, I don't have the answer, but I can say on a case-by-case -case basis, there are five stocks that I would love to buy hand over fist today. Uh, so there's a lot to do. Um, and that's that. So the implication of this article is critical. If, in fact, that's correct, we're at April 18th. If they are going to announce the having by the way this is the most important happening for all of you crypto people listening that waiting for your bitcoin coin to go to a million once they having the the supply of having minoring or whatever is going on over there uh this is the real having you need to pay attention to if you like risk assets when they have the quantitative tightening uh you are going to see uh risk assets benefit from that and i think if i had to choose two things one, cutting the quantitative tightening in half, or two, a 25 basis point cut. I think the, the former is more significant for the impact because the 10 year is going to get bid. The yields are going to go. People are going to be looking for 525. They're going to wind up at 425. And they're going to say, what happened? 
Uh, everyone will be getting short in the hole uh, as they always do, uh, and um, and it'll go the exact other way. That's the pain trade right now. No one is positioned for a rally in bonds, and uh, probabilistically, uh, the odds are skewed to our advantage over the next four to six months, uh, and we're now positioned for it uh, with all the good stuff that happened in the last week. So. That is the most important thing that we're going to cover probably in the first six months of the year. So no one's paying attention to it. It's coming around the corner in early May, according to this. And if that's the case and it gets implemented, the, the bond market's going to change. And that's going to impact the types of equities that are going to be rallying. And the equities that rally when bonds compress are emerging markets, China, REITs, banks, um, small caps especially, okay? So they've been hit a little bit with this blow off in yields. That's going to change. And what else is going to change? I'll tell you what's going to change. The counter trend rally in the U.S. dollar and in treasury yields, it's time to be faded. End of story that's what we say. You won't find another person that's going to take that view at this moment. But like all these things, sooner or later, when when we get this level of clarity and conviction, if it's not in the next few weeks, it's in the next few months, and it, and it always plays out. We saw it in fall of 2022. Uh, we saw it in fall of 2023. We're, we saw it in uh, spring of 2020. We're going to see it again. And um, uh, that's how we're positioning for it. Look, all this is opinion, not advice. Go to Hedge Fund Tips, click on terms, but um, uh, consult with your financial advisor. We only deal with uh, accredited investors and qualified purchasers who have a different level of risk tolerance, but um, uh, that's our story and we're sticking to it. So uh, here is some stuff from my buddy. You know who you are over at RBC, uh, just talking about basically momentum rolling over on the S&P. Okay, this is some technical charts. Now, what's interesting here, he does a, this is Robert Slumer, does a Fibonacci retracement thing on the S&P. And the first level is 23.6%. For those of you who believe in seashells and all that stuff, um, always worth looking at. So he's saying this could be the level of support that wouldn't surprise me, or it could go to the 38.2 level, which would get us down to 48.50 or 48.20. That was my initial target. Maybe we wind up getting there, um, but we could be done at 5% as well. Um, and uh, that just depends what happens between now and early May if this happening of the quantitative tightening is to occur. Um, uh, and, and I don't see the market going down any further after that type of an announcement would be made. Uh, it's also showing, uh, according to his Fibonacci hocus pocus, <laughs> however you want to frame it, uh, that we're at resistance in yields. I agree with you. And, um, and I actually took action a, a day before your report came out buying uh, the TLT call spread. Now, for those of you listening me for, to me for the first time, you know, you're listening to this call spread, put spread, three months, six months. That's not our knitting. Our, that comes out of a pocket of our portfolio of 10 to 15%, which are 1% derivative overlay bets, either uh, overlaid on our 8 to 12 core positions, equity long positions, or which usually have a 12 to 48 month time horizon for double pluses and multi baggers uh, expected values. And then in that 10 to 15% bucket is where we take these either hedges, tactical shorts, and most often uh, just um, uh, long dated, long premium overlays to get some excess return without drawing much leverage. Uh, and that's where we get some juice and nice alpha over time. Uh, so just to be clear on how we operate and how we think, uh, we definitely take the long view on how we allocate to companies and we take ownership positions uh, with people and managements and, and quality businesses that 
we like and we think are temporarily impaired, not permanently impaired. And, and we spend uh, 234 episodes so far explaining what that means. <laughs> so uh, you could go back and listen or listen to the next 234, your choice. Uh, but uh, we enjoy it. And uh, from the feedback we get from our great listeners and audience, uh, many of you do as well. And that makes us very happy. So, uh, so yields are overbought, according to Mr. Slumer, we agree. Semiconductor index, this is the tactical short hedge we still have on. You know, it was kind of like we, we got short at or near the top, uh, and then it just ground sideways for like four or five weeks, and we're like, ah, you know, and, and if you remember when we put these hedges on, we said, look, <laughs> there are a couple things here. Uh, one, it could keep going higher, in which case it's 2% of our equity and the, the beta in our portfolio would outperform it and eat it up anyway. It's fine. Uh, two, it could go down right away and we'll create a, an excess 10% 10, 10 of capital. We'll, we'll go along into uh, the end of the year uh, and create maybe 20 points of excess alpha, which would be incredible. But the maximum pain would be if they just grind this damn thing sideways for, <laughs> for two or three months and eat up everyone's premium. And that's what that, that's what started to happen the first four weeks. And then it changed and semiconductors started to fall. Uh, we think we could see some more weakness in that. Uh, time will tell. Uh, but we like how it's how it's working so far. Uh, double plus in a very short period of time. And our expected value on that is 5x. Uh, so, um, so that, that would be really great coupled with what we expect to see, uh, uh five to 10 X on the TLTs, which could be a, a really beautiful, uh, extra bucket of capital to get aggressively long into year end and, and create a uh, nice alpha for our money management clients, uh, which we're very grateful for. And congratulations, by the way, to all of those who have come, who came in in the first quarter and are now coming in in the second quarter. We're going to close out this raise at the end of next week. So if you have got your paperwork in, you're all set. If you haven't yet, you want to do that um, ahead of time. Don't don't wait till the last minute, because on the smaller accounts, we like to close those out uh, on time and, and just get back to explicit focus exclusively on the markets and not worrying about uh, onboarding people. For the five and $10 million accounts, you all get to call whenever you want. You could actually text me at 12 in the morning and I'll answer your phone call. Uh, you guys get bespoke service. Uh, and um, uh, that, you know, that's, that's the um, uh, gratitude I have for all accounts. And, uh, and I take it very seriously and very grateful and um, We'll go from there. So, uh, so that's semiconductor, and then energy. He's showing kind of a fake breakout, and then a pullback. Our energy exposure is Comstock Resources. We've talked about that for a number of months. It's starting to move, which we love, and it and it was even moving before natural gas is moving. So, um, this was the other article last week that we covered on the, um. on that uh, liquidity shock fear. And what they talk about in this article, the Wall Street Journal article, was that, where was it? Well, that's this week's article, was, was the banking liquidity facility. So what you wanna do is go to hedgefundtips.com. This article was called Timer Price. Yeah, here it is on the one hand and then there's the on the other hand. Here it is. OK, so they're talking about the interbank lending system, but they're also talking about ah, the, the um, Fed allows money market firms and others to park extra cash that would otherwise wind up in reserves in an overnight repurchase facility. The facility has shrunk to 440 billion in recent weeks from 2.3 trillion one one year ago. Once that facility is drained of cash, forecasting demand for bank reserves could be more uncertain, raising the risk that the Fed goes too far, i.e. liquidity shock. So this is, you know, this is running down. And this is why I think that JP Morgan analyst estimate of an announcement in early May, uh, uh, and I'm surprised more people aren't paying attention to this, uh, could be a big turning point positive, which is exciting. So if you are coming on board 
uh, in the next week and a half and we start to put money in to, to work in the beginning of May, I think you're going to be well positioned for that. Um, uh, and hopefully fully invested by the time that uh, something like that uh, would would uh, take place. Um, not that we're calling the market because we'll be buying individual companies that are down and dislocated and less sensitive to that type of stuff. But it certainly doesn't hurt when you get a little bit of tailwind of short term dislocation, followed by um, uh, an, an abrupt about face. I uh, also want to thank Pritam Biswas and Grant Vaniak for including me in their article on Reuters this week and our Buffett quote of the week. Uh, success in investing doesn't correlate with IQ. Once you're above the level of 125, once you have ordinary intelligence, what you need is the temperament to control the urges that get other people into trouble investing. And what are they? Namely, it's two things, selling in the hole and chasing the shiny objects. If you can avoid those two things, you're going to do just fine, provided your quality of analysis is is uh, is up there. Uh, this is the US dollar chart. And the reason I wanted to look at this is because it's kind of between yields and the dollar, which I, I again, I, we're of the view that it's time to fade the counter trend strength in the dollar and time to trade uh, to fade the spike in yields. Time meaning maybe it's this minute, maybe it's in two or three weeks, but it's it's uh, it's not a reversal of trend in our view. And and if you look here, it feels like the dollar's been going straight up nonstop all year. What it's effectively done was it peaked in fall of 2022. If you remember, we made a pretty bold call during that time. Um, and it just collapsed right from there. And then you had this counter trend move at the end of last year, then it rolled off in the fall and you saw small caps just rip to the moon and all of our type stocks ripped to the moon. And then it started this up, this um, uh, aftershock counter trend move. But as we've been talking about, there are a lot of similarities between what's taking place today and what took place from 2000 to 2002 before small caps, emerging markets, China, et cetera, took off like they've never taken off before. And you saw that here, you had this dollar peak in uh, late 2020, uh, followed by a crap, a kind of a crash, then these two fake out uh, counter trend moves before you got a massive rollover. And I'm not one of these end of the world you know, uh, people, you know, the deficits, et cetera, they're going to inflate away the deficits. Uh, but in the context of that, meaning, what does that mean? It means they're going to do what they did from 1948 to 1956, when debt to GDP was at 120% following World War II. And by 1956, it was at 63% because they let inflation run hot three to 5% a year. Uh, for that period that brought down debt to GDP, they're going to do the same thing now. But what they're going to keep doing while they let inflation run hot uh, is they're going to keep saying that 2% is their target because that anchors uh, inflation expectations. If you look at five-year inflation break-evens in the twos, as long as they keep expectations down and actual inflation above 2%, uh, they get to have their cake and eat it too. And uh, and what you really don't want to see is inflation fall at or 2% with 120% debt to GDP, because then you're going to get deflation and you're going to start to see defaults and uh, big contraction in money supply and huge problems. Uh, so like 2000, 2002, where you got these one, two, counter trend moves up until 2002, again, like a two year period here. And then you finally started to roll over and you had a downtrend for four or five years. Plus, uh, I think we're in a similar situation with the US dollar and that creates an incredible environment for China emerging markets when no one wants it. And it creates an incredible environment for a rally in bonds that no one's positioned for. Just wanted to, you know, with all the, uh, quote unquote sell off and five days in a row and everyone kind of getting a little on the edge of their seats this week. Just want to zoom out. This is a, a, a stream of charts that we took you through on October 5th 
of last fall and just kind of put it in context. You can see Amazon's gone straight up. But even in the last few days, you can't even see on the chart where it's pulled back. Like it barely, you, you have to like squint to see if there's even a red line. And this is what we always say, when in doubt, zoom out. Uh, even BABA, which is, you know, pain in the ass, let's just put it mildly. Uh, but that's exactly what you got to feel right before. We went, go to the article two weeks ago when we walked through the sentiment. Uh, this was, gosh, you know what, I'll do it. Just to uh, remind you folks uh, how I think about this stuff. And it might be helpful for you. Um, oh, time flies when you're having fun. It's more than two weeks ago. All right. So, okay, so we went through the financial conditions index, the new version, and when the financial condi conditions index turns down, this is when the Hang Seng explodes, and we're seeing that happen right now. But we're also seeing this part of the sentiment cycle. So you have euphoria right here, complacency right here uh, uh then you get your anger right here then you get your uh, bottom after anger then you get your fake out here where it rallies fakes out fakes out and then starts to move back down again like we are right here which is called depression and then you get the resurgence which is the disbelief rally which is the first leg of the rally in this case, it would take us well over 120. Um, and, and then you uh, you get a little fake out before you get the, the parabolic move. The other chart is the mammoth sentiment cycle. You can just see it, it's following it, it's textbook, okay? Here it's called enthusiasm is up here. Then you have the subtle warnings right here. Then you have panic, which is this flush right here. Then you have discouragement, which is right down here. Then you get this rally we got up to 120 where you get anxiety. And then guess what? It gets up to those levels. It craps out again. And you fall into this hellish period called aversion, which is right here, which is where we are right now, aversion. And then see this? It bottoms. And then you think, okay, maybe it's over. And then it goes up. And then it goes below. And you're like, oh, geez, Louise. And that's aversion again. And then you get the rip your face off rally where no one believes it. And that and once we get up to looks like around 100, 105 or so, we'll get a little bit of consolidation. And that's going to be denial where everyone says this is BS. It's going to fake us out yet again. And uh, and instead, what's going to happen? It's going to go straight up and everyone's going to say, well, what, what, what happened? I've been to this movie before, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes they, they happen overnight, like we saw Rolls Royce, we saw Bernardo, we saw Intel, we saw uh, 2020, we saw the energy companies, we saw uh, Wells Fargo, all that stuff, they happen overnight. And others, they take a few years, like range resources, like uh, others, but they always turn out if the analysis is right. And um, so we're excited because, um, when you're at the most exciting period of these processes is when you're kind of just like exhausted about it and you're like all right whatever focused on the new stuff you're not even like uh thinking about it other than just watching the cash flows and the revenues making sure they continue to go in the right direction and then when you stop focusing on it is when it takes off and and that's just what happens every single time so um all right so we did the dollar oh so we're, we're just going through some of these even bank of america Pretty good earnings, a uh, little bit on the commercial, but they're going to be fine. You can hardly see the pullback. I mean, it's up from 24 to 35. Uh, it was up to, I think, 40 for a minute. Uh, but this is going to work higher over time. Even Baxter, you know, it's ripping off the bottom. You can, you know, in the scheme of where we expect this to recover to, you can't even see what's happened in the last few weeks. It's just getting started. Uh, Cities had a nice run mini pullback if that's going to work higher over the next few years cci this is important this is interest rate sensitive it's why we bought it um 
So yes, it's up there off of its 82 lows. Yes, Elliot's involved. This is going to trade with uh, bonds. So if you don't like the TLT trade and you want to pick a high quality REIT, uh, in our view, we own um, Crown Castle, and um, and we think this will this will give you better, higher beta to uh, what we expect to happen in the bond market. Uh, you know, bonds go up if the ten year, the TLT goes from you know, call it 90 to 105, uh, should be, you know, a small move. This would probably go from, you know, 95 to probably 125, 130 over the same period. So you get a lot more alpha and a lot more yield, by the way, uh, dividend while you wait. So we think that's an incredible trade. But again, off the bottom, doing a check back. That's what it always does to take the weak sisters out. Cooper Standard. I mean, this thing, it's like, um, I was reading one of these uh, message board things, you know, uh, I think you go on FinViz and on the right side, when you're looking at some of the financials, you have these people on stock twits and this, there's this one guy going bananas. He's like, this is the most manipulated stock I've ever seen. Uh, this is this is pure manipulation because the stock is down two bucks or whatever it's down. No, this is supply and demand. It's a small cap stock. There's limited liquidity. People are scared. Uh, and and all I can tell you, I can tell you exactly what this guy's portfolio is. He wanted nothing to do with it at six bucks or five bucks, but he wanted everything to do with it at 22 bucks. So now it's 15 and he's, uh, you know, pooping his pants and uh, and scared. But at the end of the day, nothing has changed. All that's happened in the scheme of their business is. They've de-risked the balance sheet. They've turned cash flow positive. Their sales are growing. Their cash flow is growing. Their order book is growing. Their business lines are growing with their AI thing, which yeah, I give zero credit for, but might might be a big business. And their uh, sneaker thing I give zero credit for might be a big business. Uh, so they're going to continue to do fine. Uh, the riskiest time was in uh, 2022, which is when we entered, which is why we got paid and up a multi-bagger so far, but in our view, just getting started. And this is going to be a two, three-year story, and we think it can get back to earning $7 a share, even on lower industry volume, two years out. Uh, and the operating leverage is massive, and we're going to copy uh, Charlie Munger's uh, Tenneco trade from 2001, where he turned 10 into 80 million and then he and then he put the 80 million into china and turned it into a half a billion so um history doesn't repeat but it does rhyme disney again it's had a monster move you can hardly see it on the chart this thing's just getting started in its multi-year recovery um generac okay this thing it, it, it you know um we were talking about this thing in the 90s it got down to 86 it's now up to 133, just getting going. This is down from 524. We love companies like this. Um, uh, we didn't get time to talk to it uh, on the Clayman countdown. We had intended to, but we're going to actually play a interview that Liz Clayman did with Aaron Jagfeld, the CEO, and you'll hear that. Google, same thing. You can't even see it correct. It's just getting up. So maybe it consolidates for a little while before making new highs. Uh, this is a company we want to continue to own. We're, we're okay with that. Intel, we took off two thirds after this huge run last year from 23 to 50. Now the other third is down to 35. Uh, still up huge, hugely profitable off of our basis. Do we want to add here? Um, nope. We're good with what we have. Uh, if it got down to 30, we'd probably consider rebuilding a full position. But um, no, we're going to just let that third run for a while. We like the foundry play. We got full value for the legacy business in the high 40s. We were happy with that. That was nearly a double in like months. Um, so we just hang on to that. Uh, small caps, you know, they started to break out. They pulled back. That's on the rates and, and the dollar, which... Uh, you know, early May, if that ha <laughs> happening happens, uh, I think that's going to rectify itself pretty quickly. Uh, 3M, not only is it recovering off the lows, but you also got the Sol Solventum. We're holding both. Uh, we like both businesses, and I think the sum of the parts, as you look two years out, is going to be worth a lot. Uh, but again, just starting. So if you 
what I'm trying to help you do each week is zoom out, ignore the noise, because you can't even see all the noise that everyone's talking about in the last week on these charts. Okay, yeah, you'll see some volatility in the P&L on the short-term basis because we've got some option exposure, et cetera. That's great, okay? That creates opportunity, and that's what shakes out our competitors, and that's what gives us an edge over time is temperament, not IQ. We like to think we have IQ as well, but I would say if, uh, you know, if the investing gods said, listen, uh, you could keep your temperament, but we're going to take... 10 points of IQ from you, or we'll give you 10 more points of IQ and take away your uh, ice in your veins temperament, uh, I would 100% keep the temperament and give them 10 points of my IQ uh, all day long versus lose the ice in the veins temperament, knowing that I've done the work, knowing what I own, knowing the business, not the stock price, Price is what you pay, value is what you get. Knowing the value of what I own, the cash generative capacities, the returns that they generate with the capital I give them to reinvest, and um, and then the price at which I'm paying from the, from the period where that return on capital begins. And the beauty is I get to buy high return on capital businesses when they're temporarily impaired. So this, the, the PayPal's of a month, consolidating, building this bottom in the high 60s, you know, this was something we were talking about uh, and, you know, went down into the 50s and uh, and we'll be in the 80s. And, you know, what? when it's in the 80s, everyone's going to be doing cartwheels and saying, oh, my God, PayPal is uh, rocking and rolling. And, and what's going to happen is everyone's going to jump in at 80 and uh, we're going to know that it's just getting started. But what's going to happen, it's going to pull back to 70 or 65 to just take out all the people who jumped in at 80 who wanted certainty before they got involved because they don't actually like to understand cash flow statements, balance sheets, income statements, and realize they're buying one a great business at a very reasonable price right now. Um, so they won't want it at 60, but they will want it at 80. And they'll love it at 100. And just when everyone starts to love it, it'll pull back to 80 before finally, you know, recovering its way back into the high 100s, maybe low 200s uh, for starters. And then we'll see what the business looks like there, whether we should be laying off to the excited um, uh, uh, folks or um, or holding for, for a really strong uh, long-term recovery. Uh, same thing with uh, C, you couldn't give it away late last year, dropped down into the low 30s. Now it's up close to 60. Uh, SMH, that's the semiconductor. That's the one that we have tactically short. Uh, you're starting to see that on the chart here. So we'll see. But I wouldn't expect a massive thing. I, I don't think it's anything massive. But, you know, you this thing could drop down to 180 and you wouldn't even see it. I mean, that would be natural for it actually to go and test its breakout at 160. I'm not saying it will. Um, uh, basically, if it were to expire $3 lower from here, we'd be up 5x, more than 5x on that trade. So we'll see what happens over the next couple of months. Um, Stanley Black & Decker, same story. You can't even see it in this week's um, Volatility. It's just, you know, put in its floor in late 2022, working through those inventories, now starting to inflect, margin expansion, free cash flow generation, doing all the right things, demand coming back, and uh, and this will recover over time. And everyone will want it back at around 130, then it'll correct to 100 for going back to 200 plus. Uh, TLT, we just covered that. We're not going to cover. VF Corp. Uh, I love this one because... Based on price, everyone thinks, oh, something must have happened in the last few weeks. No, people got are deleveraging from other stuff in their portfolio. Uh, it, it does the same thing every time it bottoms. Look at 2009, okay? You put in this flush and then you go back down and retest it. Same thing in 2000 and 2002. They've been doing this for 125 years, ladies and gentlemen, buying and selling companies, consumer brand companies since 1898 or whatever it's been, uh, many CEOs, many iterations, but they have a DNA that they buy good brands or they buy, you know, uh, make them better, flip them, buy new brands, keep some, 
Uh, and uh, in this case, they're probably going to be selling the PAX business. You're going to wake up one morning, the PAX business is sold. They're going to delever the balance sheet. That takes the stock back to 20 bucks. Some people start to get excited at that level. And then we pull back down to 15 again. And then you just work back higher. But, you know, as you work higher, if it takes three or four years back up to, you know, 86 or 100 bucks, you know, that's a seven, eight bagger over the next three to five years. And you, you get paid for patience. It's not to say there's no risk. There's obviously balance sheet risk, but he's told you what he's going to do to fix that. And he either executes or he doesn't. I'm betting on the horse. Why? Because he did it at Logitech, which is, you know, Logitech has zero special. I mean, VF Corp has Supreme, it has Dickies, it has uh, Vans, uh, it has Timberland. And by the way, if you follow the Vans feed, the stuff they're putting out is amazing. And the stuff that we put out last week from that research report from our friend who sent it over uh, shows that channel checks, uh, the um, going out of business 50% off sales are over. Uh, they've stopped discounting. And what they're doing is they're innovating and they're putting out some really cool stuff. So much so that I bought a pair, which I've shared with you. And there are a couple other pairs that I think are pretty interesting. I never thought I'd be a Vans guy, but you know, I was when I was young. If you if you have a skateboard, you you own Vans. But beyond that, uh, they're putting out stuff that's speaking to a lot of people. And I think uh, uh, Brack and Daryl is going to turn it. And um, you know, we're going to have similar results that he was able to create with uh, the Logitech turnaround, which he entered when the stock was also down some 82% and then created a 27 bagger. Uh, biotech, okay, here we go. Everyone got excited at 100, a huge rally from 63 to 100. Now you pull back, shake out all the weak sisters back to 80. Uh, it does this every time. This is nor normal. Ba big first rally, huge pullback, take out the weak sisters, parabolic move. Huge first rally, take out the weak sisters, huge move after that. And it's just the way human sentiment works. Um, okay, this is the NASDAQ top 30. How far? Oh my goodness. All right. Um, I think we're going to skip that. we got too much stuff going on here. What is this? This is the Dow. I think you get the point of that. Let's go through some of the indicators here. Um, some of them are actually getting, even though we've only corrected some 5%, some of them are actually getting to the point where you'd be like more looking to be a buyer than a seller. Uh, here's the NYSE 10% volume index. Uh, this one still looks like it has a way, ways, a little ways to go, possibly, but it could also be like the normal 2013 where you have these pullbacks, tiny pullbacks, and then you you regroup. So um, the the biggest way to be able to relax and avoid overanalyzing these short-term indicators, these are just barometers. They're not scalpels that cut with precision, is to look at company by company. What do you pay versus what do you get? Um, and then you don't have to be so precise on this stuff or get the exact bottom tick or the exact top tick. You can play with a crayon versus a scalpel, get in the general range. If it goes against you, buy more. Uh, and um, uh, <laughs> I have no idea what's happening to that background. It's like there's a ghost unplugging and replugging it. Uh, all right, so healthcare stocks, this is down to zero. That's generally where you want to be buying, not selling. But it's been such a modest temporary move. Um, so, so it tells you the fear is greater than the supply that's being put on the market. Uh, Dow, intermediate term, breath momentum. Again, it's getting closer to areas where you'd be looking to start to find companies to buy, not to buy the wholesale index because there's probably still a little more downside on the wholesale index. S&P McClellan summation, that one's coming down. Last week we were talking, it was up here. Maybe comes down a little bit more. Uh, but they're coming down. Uh, PMO by G, DJ, uh, the Dow Jones, that's percent of companies on a uh, PMO crossover buy signal, which is basically like a 5,200 cross, these technical indicators. Key is when it gets way down, you start to see what's oversold that you could that you like on a fundamental basis. Same with the PMO by SPX. You don't tend to top when these things are down at five and zero. You tend to be nearing uh, at least an inch a short term relief rally, uh, even if even if the trend's going to go a little lower. Uh, then you've got bullish percent index. So this has come down a little bit. Doesn't have to come all the way down. Uh, it could be like 2015, 16, 2013, where 
you get these uh, half pullbacks and refreshes after these huge corrections, you get a rally and then you get these mini pullbacks and then a long-term trend for another year, year and a half. And we're kind of more in that camp. Um, same thing with NASDAQ McClellan oscillator. That's towards the bottom end of where you want to start looking. You know, these are little mini refreshes in multi-year rallies. Uh, and, and what gives us a little more confidence about that, not about buying the indices per se, is that we're seeing a lot of stuff that we want to buy today. Uh, at least four or five companies that we want to put massive amounts of money to work today. Um, even if the market goes a little bit lower, there's opportunity. Here's Nike, by the way. I thought he had a decent interview this week on CNBC. And basically what he did was he said that they got killed because they allowed remote work for too long. And in the remote work environment, they couldn't innovate and they lost share. Uh, and now they're ruthlessly focused on building a disruptive pipeline once again. I think I like where Nike is, and I know we've covered it on the Ask Me Anything questions. Uh, I don't know that this will become a position, but it's one that I have my eye on here. Uh, this one, Starbucks, some of the ones that are also hurt by China, and now that China is recovering, and that's probably the reason I haven't uh, started to build a position in or or look more aggressively at Nike and Starbucks is because we have enough China exposure through um, Alibaba. And in our view, Alibaba is going to be a much better expression of a China recovery play than these two are. Uh, but Nike would be a little bit too much China concentration if we had it. Not to say it won't become a position, but to say we have our eye on it aggressively the cheaper it gets uh third point saddle point win board seats at advance auto parts a plan to improve margins may unfold uh this one we have no worries about because they've got uh shane o'kelly from home depot's uh hds seven billion dollar business running it it's going to be great with or without dan Lowe, but i do like when there are uh influential activists involved because it just accelerates the recovery plan and that increases my clients and my IRR, and that is important. So it's not just how many bags we get, it's how quickly we get the bags. <laughs> right, Norton? Okay, Generac eyes power deals with $1 billion to spend. CEO says utility bills among the biggest monthly expenses. Generac is largest backup power generator supplier in the US, um, considering acquisitions, etc. So that's not a company in, um, Survival, that's a company in expansion, similar to some of the news we covered on VF Corp last week. Deal making is looking up as companies stop waiting out the Fed. So animal spirits are back, which is core to our thesis in Citibank and in Bank of America. So that's playing out. Uh, Bloomberg is doing what it always does, which is giving me a hard time with their super secure oh okay it actually let me in i i literally had to click like 15 buses and 10 donkeys to get into this thing um their security is mind-boggling i don't know what they're hiding back here but it's not that valuable i can assure you valuable but not not that valuable um okay so uh asml orders dive as chip makers pause high-end gear purchases this is you know this is our smh hedge um and then TSM came out with good numbers today. So, you know, it's mixed. These are going to be a cyclical business. The reason I like holding on that to that third of uh, Intel is one, we've already made our money and it, we're playing on the house's money. And two, um, we like the free money from the government. We like the foundry business, but it's unproven. And we also feel that even as cyclical as business can be, their legacy business is worth mid to high 40s, which is why we took off um, two thirds at that level. So we really have very limited downside, maybe unlimited upside on that third if he executes on the plan. Um, and so we don't have to worry about so much of this day-to-day -day noise as we would have to if we own NVIDIA or something else. Uh, fund managers are giving up on bonds in a way they haven't in 20 years. 
uh, hallelujah, uh, this is where we want to step in. All we need it to add is the word uninvestable, and uh, that would be exciting. But I don't think it's going to get to that on bonds. I think this is just a short-term positioning shakeout that's going to be changed pretty quickly with the the real happening. Serious investors need China exposure, says PIMCO Asset Manager. Forget about the short-term pain. The long-term gain is huge. You're underestimating the consumer, yada, 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 everything we already know. China GDP actually beat expectations, grew 5.3%, which was more than expected. They had expected 4.8%, and that's the second quarter in a row above 5% GDP growth. Uh, why the U.S. dollar is causing chaos across Asia, obviously, and we've also covered why that's going to change. Uh, article of the week, all done or more to come, stock market and sentiment results. So here's the semiconductor thing. As we said, you know, peaked up here, we got our hedge on, and then it just ground sideways. It's in this box. Look, it could bottom here and, you know, go off to the races. Uh, but if it breaks down here, um, you know, we think it's going to it's going to move quite a bit. So, uh, you know, and it doesn't need to move quite a bit for us to make 5x on that position. So uh, we're excited. It doesn't need to move actually much from here. It could actually grind sideways for a while and um, we could max we could realize the full value on that. Uh, OK, so we covered the claim and countdown. Here are my notes. You heard all that. Uh, we are going to play this short interview with Aaron Jagfeld from Generac because I want to keep you updated on that before earnings. So here we go. The U.S. power grid is currently barreling toward a breaking point. Hurricane season, sorry to tell you, begins in just two weeks. Severe weather could drive increased power outage activity, but... That's just one of many stressors threatening the grid. Artificial intelligence computing, which soaks up so much energy, electric vehicles, Bitcoin mining, all of that causing an unprecedented surge in electricity demand. So much so that electric utilities have nearly doubled forecasts of how much additional power they will need by 2028. We're not just talking about the East Coast. We're talking about Georgia and the southern states, too. So as worries bear down on the grid, where can businesses, consumers, and investors look for solutions? Joining us now on a Fox Business exclusive, Generac Chairman and CEO Aaron Yagfeld. Aaron, we have been talking for years about the worries about the grid. Are we any closer to policy that has improved the picture? Um, you know, we've made some strides, but I think the, the big kernel of information here is exactly as you said. The AI, um, you know, the, the boom here of, a, of AI has really caught everybody flat-footed, all the utilities, the grid operators, in terms of the forecast, because the forecasts continue to change very rapidly. And this is a, a huge amount of demand that's going to come on the grid, and, and the grid was already struggling. As you said, I mean, whether it's EV adoption or it's dealing with the effects of uh, more severe weather, all of these things have put uh, a tremendous stress on the grid, and we've been seeing that in our business for the last 25 years. Well, snow in the southern states that never used to get it at certain right. times of the year. Georgia Power was saying in the next couple of years, we have to absolutely double what we need right. for the winter. Right. Forget the hot summer. That was already baked in. Mm -hmm. So as you look at the landscape here, let's bring in the AI picture. So mm -hmm. these data centers... Are you stunned by how much they have changed the landscape of energy consumption? Absolutely. So a single chat GPT request, like if you put into chat GPT, takes 17 times more energy than a Google search. Why? Wait, whoa, whoa, 17 whoa, whoa. times that. more. So the energy intensity of that particular compute, right? It goes off into the cloud and it comes back. The amount of energy it takes to answer that chat GPT question that you've asked oh is 17 times the energy. So you think of that in terms of the multiplication of that across all the different applications where AI is showing up, and it's showing up everywhere, in businesses, in communities. I mean, every part of our lives is gonna be touched by AI in the future. And so the build out of the data centers needed to do that is a tremendous amount of power. The amount of power that's gonna be consumed by data centers in five years time is gonna be triple where it's at today. It's the equivalent of adding 40 million US households to the grid in, th in five years time. So I'm thinking about how for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction or it's an unintended consequence, possibly both ARM CEO Rene Haas. ARM, of course, makes the chip architecture upon right. which NVIDIA builds its AI right. chips. He has put out a warning in just the past couple of days, in essence saying that data centers could consume something like 20 to 25 percent 
of U.S. power requirements, up from the current 4%. Right, exactly. It's, it's stunning. Okay, so this brings me to Generac mm -hmm. and the home generators and the business generators that you all make. Uh, people are now looking and worried. They really are concerned, and they want to ensure that their homes and businesses will be bulletproof to these kinds right. of outages. Right. Are you changing anything you're doing in how you manufacture these? Well, we've, we've been adding capacity. Um, we've been looking at the future. And this is, of course, prior to these trends that we're talking about here with AI. I mean, this is relatively new within the last Suddenly. year or two, right? I mean, it's yeah. really sudden in the context of, of how quickly something has changed. So I think when, when you talk about the conversation, we're definitely getting inquiries from people, homeowners, business owners who are incredibly concerned. Power quality was already a problem before this discussion around AI. So the, the idea of keeping the grid in balance, right, having enough supply, and at the same time we're changing the mix of supply. We're moving away from some of the traditional thermal assets like coal and gas in favor of renewables with wind and solar. And let me just say that you've been smart by expanding your business. You bought Echo B, which of course is the uh, smart thermostat. Yes. I, I saw a bunch of people in California have these in their Absolutely. house now. Uh, not to mention a Spanish company called Smart EV Charging, and that's Wallbox. Correct. But uh, your stock is reflecting that. Your stock has handily beat the S&P 500 over the past 52 weeks. Right. How do you keep that trajectory going? Well, again, we're, we're expanding ourselves into areas that we call it energy technology, right? It's more than just about the generator part of our business, which will always be an important part of the business. But as the technologies change and as we look towards the future, it's not just about resiliency. That's always an important aspect for, we talked about peace of mind, right? Sure. The peace of mind that that gives you. But it's about the cost of energy going forward as well. I mean, all of these things, to add the supply we're going to need to take care of the added demand that's coming, we're going to have to add a lot of cost to the grid, and that's going to be borne by ratepayers. Great. That's exactly what I didn't want to hear. Uh, Aaron, good to have you here. It's amazing. The single prompt, 17 times as much as a Google search. Unbelievable. Well, we appreciate the uh, new information and keeping our viewers ahead of all of this. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Aaron Yagfeld of Generac. Zoetta. And we're back. And then... The Bank of America Fund Manager Survey. Tuesday, we put out a summary. Thanks to my buddy over there. You know who you are over at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Um, we put a summary of this out on Tuesday. This month, they surveyed 224 managers with $638 billion AUM. Here were the key points. Number one, we agree with Hartnett. So that's Michael Hartnett who writes it. One of the best in the business on his contrarian trades, but only the first half of each peer, uh, pair. So, uh, we, so we agree with long bonds, long China, long staples. His, his quote, short Japan, short industrials, short commodities, long cash, we are agnostic. I will say looking over commodities today, uh, I think orange juice, feeder cattle, live cattle, cocoa, um, there were like four or five, I think, almost generational shorts uh, could be very attractive. Grains are already down. And all the non-USD currencies, I think we're going to start as the U as the once that once we fade the USD counter trend rally, all these others are going to move. I think euro moves up uh, by the back half of the year. Pound moves up by the back half of the year. Looney moves up all my Canadian mining maniacs up there uh australian dollar moves up yen moves up and that might be the other intervention remember coordinated global central bank coordinated policy they've said as much uh bank of japan has let the the peg on the uh, yield curve control go they did their first hike Magnitude is less important than direction. They did a 10 basis point hike uh, and they um, stopped the peg on the 10 year yield. I think their next step is going to be to defend the yen against the dollar and other currencies. And that's going to be a sea change on how most people are positioned right now. So um, that's that. Now, he also says short Japan. 
if you put if you you put a gun to my head, long or short Japan, I'd probably take short Japan. I'm I'm more agnostic on that one. Short industrials, more agnostic on that one. Short commodities, those are the ones. Long cash, nah, I don't like that trade. I don't like that trade, and I don't know that these pair trades go together. But I like the first half of three out of four, and the other one is the long China is further supported by. Not only is everyone on one side of the boat short China, which is actually, again, the second most crowded trade this month, short China equities, but economic outlook is finally starting to look up again. If you remember a couple months ago, we're like, look at this pessimism, look what happens after. Well, now it's starting to turn up. And I think uh, in this earnings season, people are going to see enough positive results that they're going to say, how bad can it be? You know, I mean, it's like at this point, you're getting single digit multiples for high quality businesses with moats generating massive amounts of cash at, you know, a third of the valuation as, as the U.S. counterparts in some cases, a tenth of the valuation. Uh, you got to you got to take a second look. Number two, managers are dumping bonds like it's going out of style at the exact wrong time. So you've been two other times in the last 20 years where managers uh, we've seen that big of a monthly drop in bonds, large traders and hedge funds, which is the red line here uh, on the commitments to traders report. Haven't been this short 10 year treasuries since October 2028. The actual smart money, which is not the hedge funds, but the commercial hedgers are the longest 10 year treasuries they've been since October 2018. So where's October 2018? Right here at the last bottom in the 10-year note. Uh, commercials were long, hedge funds were short in the hole, massive one-year rally. Same thing now. I think we're getting very near, if not there. I think we're gonna see a, a reversal here and a move higher, compression in yields. And what could be the catalyst? The catalyst could be what no one's paying attention to, which is early May. The, the real happening of the quantitative tightening. So um, now, who's positioned for that right now? No one, which is why it becomes the quote, maximum pain trade moving forward, along with all equity groups that will benefit from a compression of yields, emerging markets, China, small caps, REITs, banks, utilities, staples, etc. Or you can follow the crowd and hope for the best. Third most important point from the fund manager survey, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Headlines are pointing to the idea that because sentiment and equity allocation is the highest it has been since January of 2022, we must crash. Why? Because we started crashing in February of 2022. They are paralyzed by recency bias, which we've talked about many times on this podcast. If you look further back, the level of sentiment and allocation also resembles early 2013 and early 2000 and 2009 both of which periods had one to two one and a half to two years of gas left in the tank for their respective rallies so see it here see it in 2009 and the market rallied for another two years till 2011 see it again after the 2011 crash in early 2013 it got up to this level and rallied for another couple of years so yeah or you can just look at the most recent instance because we crashed we're going to crash again but we're not even close to those levels which is also kind of funny um sentiment is also the most bullish since same, same exact story same levels as 2009 2013 or you could say oh but it's just like 2022 no it's not it's nowhere close to 2022 bad analogy and point number four are the sellers out of uk equities and real estate yet so i'll uh so they're currently one standard deviation below their long-term average in terms of REITs. And again, if you get the halvening, yields compress, REITs go through the moon. We're expressing it through TLT and CCI. Uh, there are many other ways to express it. And UK equities recovery, uh, they're 0.2 standard deviation below their long-term average. I think there's going to be huge opportunity there. Pound's going to recover, so you get two bites of the apple. And that's why one of the reasons we're in GXO is because the majority of their revenues are in UK. Uh, so we're not only going to get the business recovery, we're going to get the country recovery, we're going to get the currency trade 
Uh, and we're gonna get, 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 when no one wants, 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 and that's what we do. Rinse, repeat, over and over, patience, temperament. You can have 10 IQ points. I'll take the temperament all day long. Um, so, probably a good thing I didn't go to Harvard Medical School after all. So, <laughs> moving along, City. While City has had a nice move for us, we think it has further to go in coming years. So yeah, this has been a monster move, but almost doubled in a few months. Uh, so now it's going to pull back, consolidate, because everyone bought up at 60. Maybe they take it down to 50 before the next leg higher. Uh, earnings, we're fine. Better than expected, top line, bottom line, you can go through that. Bill Nygren talks about it for a couple minutes here. I like what he has to say. That's why I put it in there. Uh, but you can go through segment by segment. We, If we're going to do Ask Me Anything, we got to get through that. Sentiment's coming down. It's not in an extreme on the low side, but got down to 34 Maybe it goes to 10 or 20 before we actually bottom. Uh, don't know, don't care. There's plenty of companies that are trading like it's at zero and uh, I wanna put money to work there, but uh, there, there you go. Um, okay, so podcast, you guys sent in your AMAs. We are open for the smaller accounts until the end of next week and then we'll close it up for Q2 and open sometime in Q3. Maybe, uh, well, we don't know when in Q3 it'll be. Um, and then moving along, uh, the survey, we got that earnings, George got them up consumer staples, top 30 weights in the last 60 days, they have been revised. They're basically flat, uh, negative 0.07%. So seven basis points in the last 60 days, that's flat next year, negative 37 basis points. Uh, so some of the companies, Costco's up. Coke's down, Target's up, Colgate's up, Kimberly Clark's up, Constellation's up. What I've got my eye on is Brown Foreman. I'm not there yet, but um, kind of interesting. Kraft Heinz is up, Tyson is up, and you can see what's down. Procter & Gamble, Walmart. That's a little surprising. Walmart's estimates are down. How much are they down? Uh, eight, 13 cents. So that's about 6%. All right. Keep an eye on that. I think that one's had a run. So maybe it is due for a break. Let's take a look at, uh, Walmart. Yeah, that's, that's run. That's probably going to breathe for a little bit. Uh, and then consumer discretionary up half a percent top 30 weights in the last 60 days. And for next year up. 37 basis points or th almost four tenths of 1%. Um, Chipotle's up, Airbnb's up, O'Reilly's up. O'Reilly's up, that's interesting. That might um, tell us something about advanced auto parts. AutoZone's up too, that's good. Uh, all the home builders are up. Amazon's down. 13. 24 cents, it's about 7%. Um, all right, well, they're gonna report soon enough, so we'll figure out what's going on there. And economic data, retail sales were great this week. Uh, housing starts were not. I think there was a big build in energy. Yeah, build in inventory, so maybe, Oil will take a breather, which would be good for everyone's panic about inflation. Um, by the way, inflation is two things. It's rents, lagged rents, and uh, basically car insurance right now. All I can tell you, I don't know how or why, insurance premiums are not going to stay this high forever. Uh, this is a cyclical business. I think I shared the story when I, you know, 10 years ago, no, it's got to be. 13 years ago, we were looking to buy insurance companies so we could control the float, kind of mini Berkshire, invest the things. I'm still looking for an insurance company, by the way, if you've got a small one, specialty PNC with, you know, half a billion dollar portfolio that I can pick up, uh, I'm interested. So all you bankers that want to <laughs> sell me your inventory, uh, call me maybe. Uh, but um, I don't, 
you know, we're in a we're in an aberrationally hard market. And the thing about insurance premium from a generalist, because there are a lot of in, friends in insurance that are going to call me and text me after this podcast, uh, is when it's a soft market, as it was following the great financial crisis. Um, I remember them saying that it was going to harden, you know, within 12 months, I go to all these analyst meetings at the New York Society of Security Analysts and all these smart insurance CEOs and specialty would get up and all these sell side analysts and blah, blah, blah. It took like five years. I mean, prices were in the gutter. And then it gets hard and everyone thinks they're going to stay high forever. And it's just simply unsustainable. I think what you're going to see, I don't know what will be the catalyst to bring insurance rate down because effectively insurance is just financing other people's fraud, uh, as Charlie Munger would put it. Uh, So I don't know what would cause that. Maybe a harder crackdown on that, number one. Or number two, maybe more and more people will just start self-insuring. Uh, in which case, uh, because the the math doesn't help it, and then it just starts a trend. But I wouldn't bet on premiums staying that high for for uh, much longer. And and when you see the prices at which these businesses are trading for in the private markets, uh, it's a rare time. So if I'm in that business, I want to be a seller of equity, not a buyer. And if um, and if and if and if I'm and if I want to scale in that business, I'm building up cash reserves because when those premiums come off, I want to roll up and buy every small uh, brokerage or whatever business you're trying to buy that thought the good times were going to last forever. So now's the time to make hay while the sun shines. Build your reserves so you can buy these businesses when they get hit by a cannon and premiums cut thirty percent. And you can go in and buy their business at a three, four times multiple because they got their expenses up and their Lamborghinis up and their memberships up and their private jets up. And then all of a sudden their revenue is cut by a third and they they don't know what to do. And you get to solve their problem. Remember what I always say, (laughs) their liquidation is our opportunity. Their forced selling, their forced liquidation is our opportunity. So, um, Take it for what it's worth. I think you're paying zero for this advice uh, or opinion. Uh, but if I'm in that space, I'm preparing for very good times ahead. Good times if you're a buyer, bad times if you're a forced seller. But do not think these premium rates will last in perpetuity. When they turn, they're going to turn very hard. And Traveler's earnings this week may have, in fact, been the canary in the coal mine. If you want to know what I mean by that, go look up their earnings and we'll talk next week. Uh, All right. The podcast is over, but now we're going to start the Ask Me Anything section where our loyal, amazing viewers send in their questions each week of uh, anything they'd like to know. So the first one comes from David M. Hey, Tom, was wondering if you were interested in Lulu at these levels now, high quality business that you can get at late 2020, early 2021 levels. And since it's doubled revenues, almost tripled earnings and net income, has a super clean balance sheet with more cash than long-term debt and it's tripled free cash flow as well. Thanks for taking my question and keep up the great work. Uh, You know, it's interesting. I did look at that one for a second this week. Let's see if I had any justification for passing on it. Okay. All right. Uh, Now, this looks pretty damn amazing. Let's take a look here. So first thing I want to do, well, yeah, see, so when you zoom out here, it's like, you know, on the one hand, it looks like it's had this monster crash, although it's, you know, 516 down to 347. If you zoom out to the longer term, it doesn't really like, it looks like, I mean, it could pull back, 
you know, another 100 points and it would hardly make a dent. But leaving aside squiggly lines, which are useless, let's take a look at, um, first thing I would wanna know here is the bear thesis. That's all I would wanna know. Why do people sell it down from 500 down to 347? What, you know, what, what is the narrative that's going around, okay? And is it temporary or is it permanent? I mean, it's really hard to sell me on bad things happening when their gross margins are improving and their free cash flow is improving. So let's take a look here. Maybe they missed the quarter by a penny or something and all these levered longs that bought the shiny object at 600, loved it at 600 or 500. Now they can't get rid of it fast enough at 347. Let's see here. Revenues are great. Um, where, let me see the share count. <laughs> Bringing the share count down. Um, oh, I got to make this smaller so you guys can see everything. I forgot. Okay. Um, balance sheet. Wait, this can't be right. They have zero long-term debt and they have the leases, 1.1 billion of leases, but zero long-term debt. Wow, two and a half billion dollars of cash. Cash flow story, let's see. Cash from operations is growing. Free cash flow is growing. Um, yeah, I think you got to definitely <laughs> three, three and a half times, four times sales. Next 12 months. Yeah, margins are holding up. I don't know what's not to love. As a matter of fact, you know, my nine-year-old, we, we got to go to California um, in two weeks for some tournament. And she was asking me, like, the town we're staying at. Um, I think we're staying in Laguna Beach. And she's like, do they have a Lululemon there? I'm like, what the hell do you need Lululemon for? And anyway, apparently she has a lot of Lululemon. And... Um, so that's interesting that a nine-year-old cares about Lululemon because that kind of tells you that the brand is relevant. It's not just, you know, only suburban housewives going to Pilates class. It's actually um, a widespread brand. Uh, look, Dave M., I cannot find anything wrong with this, so I'm going to do a little more work on it. And... Um, I'm probably going to have to wait for it to come down lower and it may not, but as you know, I'm super happy with errors of omission. Uh, I, I'm uh, rigid about uh, errors of commission. Uh, those are unacceptable. Errors of omission I can live with, but um, I'm going to start doing the work and I think I'm going to have a little time to do the work. Hopefully it comes in a little more, but I, I, like, I like, uh, like what you got there. Sagar... Kanya Kia. Kanya Kia. Sagar. Okay. Hey, Tom. Sagar here from San Francisco. Thank you for your podcast. You do week in and week out giving valuable knowledge to us. I wanted to know what your thoughts are on Ulta. I know it's not off nearly enough from all time highs as you like. However, recession or not, the ladies will continue to buy their makeup to a point where even with price raises, they will come back to buy more. Stock is down on CEO mentioning short-term weakness in consumer demand, similar to Nike, Lululemon, and others, but trading at a PE of 18, low double-digit growth, high institutional ownership. Would this be one of those buy and hold forever stocks? Well, I like that category, Nike, Lulu. Let's take a look at Ulta. Okay, down from 574 to 425.
Alt uh, cash flow machine, revenues growing, return on capital, okay, gross margins, uh, a little bit of gross margin compression, but that's probably temporary. We'll take a look at that. Okay, interesting. I mean, we have an expression of this through um, Estee Lauder, so we agree with the general thesis, but um, let's see here. Okay, so revenues look good, keep growing. See what they're doing to share count. Taking it down. That's good. Balance sheet. They probably have a little bit of debt with all the lease exposure. So they got 766 million. No, they don't have debt. They have just the leases. So that's pretty good. Uh, cash flow operations 1.2 billion holding in there 1.3 billion Wait, oh that was net income okay uh, 1.5 billion on the cash from operations and free cash flow is holding in there at a bill it's down a little bit from 2023 but it's okay um Compounder, good quality business. I mean, again, this is, uh, can you take a look at this here? All right, so we got Lulu, Nike, Ulta, Yeah, let that one come in just a little. If you can get that. If you can get that in the low 400s, I think you're probably okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's done going down yet, um, Sagar, but I think you're spot on. And I think it doesn't really matter probably from the long term, but uh, just be patient. Or, or uh, that's how I would think about it. I think if you bought it here, and you had a three to five year view, you're probably gonna be fine. Um, Valerio, if, by the way, good work. I mean, Dave, all of these have been great so far this week. Um, Valerio, Marco, Pomoni. A German, I guess, no, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, hey, Tom, would like to know your thoughts about the following. The high interest rate environment seems to be unable to tackle the inflation rate as expected by the Fed, or at least seems to take considerable amount of time. At the same time, employment remains high. Do you think it can relate to the following two aspects? Number one, the high budget deficit of the U.S. government debt uh, without 6.3%. U.S. may already be in recession. Okay. Um, number two, during the pandemic, a lot of cash has been distributed and still a lot is on the sidelines invested in short-term bonds. So with high interest rates, Americans earn a lot of income from these bonds and are able to spend keeping pressure on inflation and sustaining economic activity. The people that have massive bond portfolios are the lowest marginal spenders. Okay. You're not going to find the person who spends their last marginal dollar with a massive muni portfolio it just doesn't doesn't work out that way so uh that thesis although it's been bandied about as the new narrative is complete nonsense um but it's getting headline traction so it'll keep running for another few days uh budget deficit that's like saying you know we'd still be in a great depression if they didn't do the 800 60 billion dollar bailout in fall of 2008. The fact of the matter is we're running a deficit. So um, whether there would or would not 
have been a recession, it's already happening and we still have $3 trillion of excess money supplying the system. So um, I wouldn't count on an imminent recession, especially since the fact that we just had two. We had one in 2020, and then we had a second one, technical one, in 2022, when I kept telling everyone, we just had two quarters of negative GDP. Everyone's waiting for a recession that already came and no one believed me. And we just rallied straight up from October, 2022 until recently. So um, I don't know how answering these two questions is gonna help you make money though. This is, this is the noise that keeps you from making money. What makes you money is what Sagar and Dave did, which was find high quality businesses that are cash generators through recessions, through great financial crises, through expansions, through pandemics. Uh, they're just money making machines. Then the question is, we know the value we're getting, the key, then the only question becomes the price. And we just don't wanna pay a price when everyone is for being forced to liquidate for unnatural reasons. And we can pick up high quality assets in a pocket of inefficiency. Uh, that will be short lived and eventually it reverts back to the mean. So I don't know how to help you on this Valerio other than what we do is we focus on buying quality businesses when they're temporarily impaired and we try to ignore as much of this noise as possible. We pay attention to it, but it doesn't factor much into whether we buy a piece of an economic piece of a company or we don't. Um, Matt Del Priori. Hey Tom, love the pod. I know you're indifferent on Tesla, but at 150, does it interest you with recent layoffs? They're focusing on growth and turning into a service business. Automakers will use their charging station technology, Cybertruck, full self-driving robo taxi in the future. As a long-term shareholder, 175 cost basis, I think the future is bright. Um, not for me. Uh, the reason that I've never been long or short the stock since inception for better or for worse is because um, I think there's material key man risk there. And um, uh, I, I don't want that, that level of um, binary outcomes. That said, you know, at a hundred bucks, would I take a punt in my PA maybe, but I, I don't think I could risk other people's capital that I'm responsible for in a company like this. Um, love, love the technology love the genius love all of that i think it has a good chance to change the world if it hasn't already i think spacex even more um but uh again i'm agnostic but if you put a gun to my head and you said you have to own it i'd say talk to me at 100 we probably never get 100 but if we do I'd be more interested in taking a deeper dive. At these levels, it's just like gambling, black or red. Maybe I buy it at 150, it goes to 300. whoop de doo You know, maybe I buy it at 150 and, you know, Musk doesn't get his pay package and he leaves the company and uh, it goes to like $25, robo-taxi or not. Um, I wouldn't bet against it. I think you're probably right long-term. Um, certainly Ron Barron's been right for a long time and, and scored, but it's outside the framework of what I do. And that I think is the most important thing as you become more seasoned in the business is get really good at one thing and don't deviate. There are so many ways to make money. You don't have to be in all of them. And chances are, if you try to be in all of them, you're going to lose at all of them. Just be really good, as good or better than any of your competition in one particular space and focus on that and compound your money and sleep like a baby and don't worry about people who might, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the tortoise and the hare, the Aesop's fable. You know, you'll have these people that catch the Teslas and catch the NVIDIAs one year and they have a blowout year and then two years they're gone, they blow up because they thought it was skill and it was actually luck because there's no framework to buying a basket of companies trading at 20 times revenue, losing money. And just because one works and is a 10 bagger and makes up for a lot of losers and you're net positive, um, the next time you get overconfidence bias, 
and you bet heavy on the next one trading at 10 times or 20 times revenue and losing money and it's a donut hole and you're and you're toast and i've seen it over and over which is why the value guys that that know quality value not value traps uh they're around for decades and decades and decades and they make their clients billions over time and these uh, momo shiny object chasers they're flashing the pan they get on the cover of a magazine and two years later you never heard of them again they're they're doing some ai startup it's like wait a second i thought you were running three billion dollars now you're doing some startup and you know wherever and you've never been in the tech industry in your life and it's just it's just the nature of the business um martin florini tom what's your view on the argo sector and fmc agro sector and fmc in particular i know you've discussed it a few times but it's reached an attractive price in my view my main concern is whether they plowed through excessive inventories and another is sheer amount of debt and variances in free cash flow uh I, I think you're. A, I I think it's interesting. I I definitely want some ag exposure, and I think FMC is um, one that I'd be very interested in. So it's at fifty six. So you know, you buy it goes to forty five. I mean that that that's a key analysis. Is like if you bought it at fifty six and it goes to forty five, would you be a seller or a buyer? If you'd be a seller, don't buy it now. If you'd be a buyer then you know you've got a great company and stick with it for the long term. You know, these are a little cyclical. It's free cash flow negative right now. And what you have to figure out is that a temporary impairment or a permanent. And what you're seeing is they've already turned the corner in the last three quarters. So um, revenues are down. That's definitely cyclical. They have had other instances like that in 2015, 2016. And over time, it just trends up because the demand goes up. Their margins are a little bit impaired. The returns are on, on invested capital are going down. And uh, and by the way, I think the market knows that because it's down some 65% from its peak just a year and a half ago. So um, I think if you want exposure in ag, this is uh, a good place to get some exposure. And it would be something that we would consider after doing a little bit more work, but we're almost there where we would feel confident to uh, to move ahead. So yeah, I like that one. I haven't done all the work I need to do to be like pound the table, but I've done enough to be very, very interested. So a uh, good reminder on that one. Uh, Brandon Sarvandian, new listener, absolutely love your podcast. I'm in a company, Perion. And they recently got demolished on forward guidance. Their biggest customer, Microsoft, cut a huge portion of their revenue. They have great balance sheet, no debt, ton of cash. I believe they have almost as much cash as their market cap. My question is, should I double down here at 11 or cut my losses and move on? Well, you have another option, which there's three options. Every day you wake up and you look at the businesses you own and you say, I can buy, I can sell, or I can do nothing. And I will tell you, the better investor you become, the more often your answer will be do nothing because this is the strangest business in the world and it's the antithesis of what, what it requires to be a great entrepreneur, which an entrepreneur and a business owner is paid for massive action equals massive results. The more they put out, the more they get back. The busier they are, the more money they make. An investor is the complete antithesis. The less they do, the more money they make, the more they sit on their hands after they've done analysis and they've owned a handful of high quality businesses. Uh, the key is to sit tight through the noise and through the headlines. So let's take a look at Perry. And okay, so the revenues are flying. Margins seem to be holding up. What do they do? Digital advertising solutions to brands, agency, and publishers in North America. Wildfire content monetization platform, cross-channel digital advertising software. So this is one of those businesses that you have to really understand what they do and where's their moat. 
because they grow super fast until they're irrelevant. And that can happen overnight, which is why Buffett always avoided these type of technology things because it wasn't there was no way to measure the, the long term durability of what they're providing. So if you're in the business or understand the business, maybe you have an edge that an outsider would have trouble. But it sounds like for Microsoft, they didn't provide enough proprietary specialized service that it was worth them staying as a customer. The question is, is that idiosyncratic? Is that a one off? Or is that going to be a trend? If it's a trend, then none of the financial analysis we're going to do makes sense, which is why we tend to be in things like Generac and Stanley Black and Decker and uh, uh, advanced auto parts. And, you know, to a lesser extent, Amazon has a moat, Baba has a moat, uh, Google has a moat, but they better start using that data quickly uh, and effectively. Um, all right, let's take a quick look here. Yeah, I mean, these revenues are growing like a wildfire. So if they, they lose a third, takes them back down to 400 million of revenues, cost of revenue, where is the share count? Yeah, they're also adding a lot of shares. It's probably a huge amount of stock-based comp, which is not abnormal in these fast growing newer tech type of platforms, but something I would keep an eye on. The balance sheet, they got 472 million of cash. How much debt? Uh, zero, that's good. Cash flow. Uh, let's see. 154 million of free cash flow. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty damn cheap. Um, huh. um, so I'd want to understand why is this cycle different than this cycle when they collapsed in 2015? What was the, so I would go back to these calls and these financials and I'd say, what was happening here that they collapsed last time and what's happening this cycle that's different? Why is this one going to be temporary versus take many years to get back to where you started? Um, obviously the business is doing much better financially than it was at this level, but it also had a lot less shares. Uh, just at Immediate glance, I, I would pass on this. I, I wouldn't even spend the time to do more work. Um, but I think in your case, since you already own it before you puke it out in the hole um, or get out in time before it goes a lot lower, you have to know what's why did it crash last time and take six years to, to even start to recover? And what's happened this time that's similar or different and what's going to cause the non-Microsoft customers to stay? And what does the business look like pro forma without Microsoft? Assuming all the rest stay and then assuming half of them leave. And uh, at this valuation, it's pricing in a lot of bad news, but maybe not all the bad news. And that's really what you need to dig in and get the work. And that's, you know, that's a, that's a few week, weeks worth, worth of work. Um, but I can see why you got involved. I can see that you potentially couldn't predict Microsoft leaving, uh, but that's why we would probably avoid this type of business to start with. And you'll learn more about how we think about different industries and businesses as we go forward um, and, and why this wouldn't get through our initial filter, no matter how attractive the financials looked. And they do look attractive and I understand why you sent it in. And I think you're on the right track in terms of the math but maybe not yet uh, having enough experiences with how different companies and, uh, and um, new technologies operate through different cycles. So that's where you've got to find out your buy, sell, hold. I There's no way I could know enough in um, the amount of work that it's going to take to figure that out. And, and you're going to have to do that. But at least I can point you in the right direction. And thank you for listening and welcome and thank you for the good question. 
And my buddy Alan says, just walked by a TV and saw CNBC now saying, quote, semi-trade now showing some cracks. Made me smile. Meanwhile, it's down 10% already. Uh, thanks, Alan. Max Peters, love the podcast. Hey, what do you think of Lear Corp? All the fundamentals look great and the stock's been flat for some time. Forward PE, single digits, quality company, been around since 1917. I think I like it. I think I covered it before. Let me just see. I mean, if 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 uh, Boeing is too hairy for you, I think this one's probably all right. Um, but I think Lear also, the only thing you got to watch about Lear. Okay. Yeah. I think you're going to be fine here. I think it's like Boeing without the hair. Let's see. But I'd rather have Boeing. Um, yeah, it's already doubled up off the bottom, but uh, I think this is a lagged play like we had with um, Rolls-Royce. And I think you're going to be okay here. Let's see. That looks so good. Profitability. Margins are very low margin business, but um, high volume at least. Sheet. Yeah, a little leverage on the balance sheet, but I, I think you're okay here. I think you're okay. Pretty nice find. Um, and thank you for sending it in. So with that said, we're going to be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now. Really amazing AMAs this week. I can tell a lot of you have been around for some time, are really starting to learn, and even some of you new guys are, and gals are picking it up very quickly. So, um, so good. We're delivering some value. And uh, on to the next one. We'll see you back here for episode 236. Bye for now.